Sir, can Ganesh, shall we start the program? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, yeah. please. Yeah. Good afternoon. I feel extremely glad to welcome everyone to this public lecture. Honorable Chairperson for KCHR, Professor Ken Ganesh, Honorable Director, Professor Dineshan Vadakini, Respected Speaker, Dr. Abbas Panakal, Distinguished Scholars, and my colleagues. Today, we have a wonderful uh, and fruitful academic session by Dr. Abbas Panakal on the topic Decolonial Historiography of Malabar Resistance. Dr. Abbas Panakal is a historian currently affiliated with the School of History at the University of St. Andrews, UK. He also serves on the advisory board for the Religious Life and Belief Center at the University of Surrey, UK. Dr. Panakal is engaged in a research project, project that investigates the processes of integration and indigenization within vernacular communities. His published works include Musalia King, Southeast Asian Islam, Matrilineal, Matriarchal and Matrifocal Islam, and South Asian Islam. He holds directorial positions at both the Ibn Battuta International Center of Intercultural Studies and the International Interfaith Initiative. His areas of research include language, religion, law, indigenization, integration, interreligious engagements, and intercultural cooperation. After the completion of this event, I'm sure that you all will feel enriched with knowledge on this particular topic. Before we start the session, all the audience are requested to keep their microphones on mute during the session. After the session, we will have a question answer session. The questions can be typed in the chat box and we will read them out for the convenience of the speaker. If you still have any concerns about typing, you can ask the questions directly. For this purpose, you just click on the raise hand option. We will read your name accordingly and you can ask the questions directly. I feel honored to welcome you all once again for this webinar. Uh, our director, Professor Dineshan, is unable to chair today's session due to some ill health. Hence, I request Professor Ken Ganesh to kindly take over the session. Thank you. Welcome, Professor Abdas Panikel, and I request you to start the uh, your lecture almost immediately. Whatever that is necessary for discussion, I'll come towards the end while discussion. Thank you. Thank so you so much. Why don't we proceed? Yeah, great. Uh, great to have you here and meet you all. It's a great pleasure to join you. As you know, the history or historiography of Malabar, it's not just maybe a learning experience for us or teaching experience for us. More than that, it's a life because we all born there and we were living with these and histories. Uh, because uh, I'm originally from Malabar and also, also maybe the epicenters of the issues that happen in all the time, you know, the resistance. Even maybe it's from 16th century till uh, 1922, because I'm from Tirurangadi. Uh, that means uh, my, my home is in Wengara. So earlier time, uh, maybe long back, you know, two generations before, Tirurangadi was the Mahal. Mahal means the center, the mosque the congregational mosque that our people were traveling long way, five kilometers to Chidrangadi to pray, Friday, Friday prayer. It was at the time of uh, uh, Sayyid Alavi Mamburam Thangal. He built a mosque near to my place. It's called Irugulam, Irugulam Palli. So uh, that's uh, maybe last generation he did it. So Tirudangadi was well connected to us and the stories in our mind and even now, it was not just story of Muslims, you know, this was related to all people in the village. Uh, there, was, there was no discrimination of uh, uh, maybe religion or caste, anything in between, because I have got a neighbor 
her name is uh, Cheru Chakki. We call her Chechi. So she, my, my, this just I share, you know, the background information. When she passed away, she called the last, because my mother was near to her. Uh, she called the last Padachone, Mamburan Bangale. Because this was a culture we developed over there. Then my mother told me that she'll be in heaven because she called the God the last and then the Mamburan Tangal. You know. This is the culture, this is the interreligious culture we nurtured in the region. But when I went to the history, history of uh, Malabar resistance, I found that there are a lot of stories of uh, Hindu Muslim fights and also the stories of uh, hatredness and moreover, you know, the terminologies used, it was a rebellion was used, re resistance never used. You know. The word rebellion was used and uh, also fanatism was there. Lot of uh, terminologies that normally used from the othering the people, it was seen over there. That really induced me or helped me to go through deeper into the history of my land. So let me go after these, you know, to the slides. I will just show the slides and it will be just uh, interesting maybe to go through this. I'll share my screen. Is it okay to, I don't know, it's some issue for sharing the screen. I don't know. I have some issue for sharing the screen here. I'll just. Um, yeah, we will operate it from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just you can just operate because let's see. I can also see here. That's good, maybe. Let's uh, go to the slides. Yeah, great. This introduction, that would be good. Because as you know, what is Malabar? You know, Malabar was a, a different time. Uh, it has different connotations. You know? Ibn Batuta, when he traveled over there in uh, 14th century, he was telling that it started from Goa, long, long distance from our region. He started the Malabar boundary from over there. And even you look into the Kisa Sakravarti format, the first mosque in Malabar, it was built in Barkur. It also a uh, bit far away from Mangalore. You know, I, I had chance to go and visit all the places. So I found it, the geography is much connected to Malabar. And now it's another part of uh, maybe not even in Kerala. It's out of Kerala. So Malabar had different connotations and different boundaries in different times, time frame. But this is the one I just want to show you that uh, when British took over Malabar from Tipu Sultan, this is the uh, Francis Bukhan, uh, and he has uh, shown this one to us. And we'll go to the, just in this, this uh, time, I would tell that everybody, maybe a lot of scholars with me and a uh, lot of uh, people who work on the field with me, maybe let us discuss, you know, what is the prelude of uh, this resistance? British called this prelude of rebellion. They always highlight the incident in Pukotur. They will tell that there was an incident in Pukotur where the uh, Muslim, uh, maybe the head of, he was the secretary to the Khilafat committee over there and he was fighting against the Tirumal part of that Pukotur. So that is the history, that's maybe the narrative we have been hearing. But I could find from my research that it was as a just a propaganda from British. It has nothing to do with the events happened in 20th August, because we are in August. We know all the events happened, the, the drastic things happened in August. 20th August, they were coming to arrest the people in Tiruranadi. So later on, they were telling that in uh, Pukotu, these people, uh, Wadake Vital Muhammad and his brother and his subordinates, they were trying to kill uh, Tir Tirmulpar. And also, he was trying to maybe change that um, palace, small palace, 
into a mosque because it's described over there. But when we go deeper into the history of the things, we will find that because there was some amount that uh, Thirumal Pad owed to this person and he asked that I have to get these 300 rupees. It was now it's small amount, you know, but it was very big amount in do, do, during that time. He asked, I have to get the money now because he was acting against him. That what happened, you know, Thirumal Pad don't have that much of money with his hand. So he's in British document is saying that he borrowed from two Muslim tenants. Two Muslim tenants were giving some of their gold, you know, to settle the matter at the night. It was in July 31st and August 1st. It was described to everybody. So there is a communal harmony. There was no communal issues among them because there were uh, also Adigari. Adigari was a Muslim. He was against this uh, Khilafat person, you know. So Muslims were in the part of uh, landlord and uh, non-Muslims were also joining in the Khilafat or Congress part. These kind of things are there. So the prelude, I have a disagreement in that case that pre prelude of resistance or the British manipulated the prelude of uh, rebellion, it is not happened from Pukotur. Actually, I found that it was happened from Calicut when after, because you know that uh, the Congress leaders were arrested, even all our famous leaders of Calicut were arrested for six months because of uh, the Yakubasan's uh, visit over there. And they were released du during the release time. A number of people from Tidurangadi, they were going there to uh, have a procession. And that time, the collector Thomas, he was just uh, passing from office and people just uh, blocked him. And it became a personal issue for him. This really the matter that led to all massacres, all the issues in Tirurangadi. That is what is the, maybe the decolonial historiography in case of a prelude of this resistance I have to present. Maybe if anybody of you have other opinion, we will discuss it. And this I have brought out in my new book that uh, all these issues, uh, because related, because it, it's uh, really described in British document that there were a, there were a huge number of people. The, those people were not able to get managed by the uh, police in the Calicut beach. And it was a shame for the uh, British uh, collector, Thomas, and he revenged against the people who, and he understood that according to the maybe secret information, those people were from more of, most of them were from Tidurangadi, and he tried to enact against the Dungadi people. Let's go to the next one. Next slide. I can play from here or? Let's go to the next slide. Uh, in this case, you know, I will tell you it's that- It's being operated. Being operated. Being operated. Okay. There are some technical issues. Okay, okay. No, just okay. That's good. Just uh, for this research, you know, because a lot of researches have been done, maybe many, many books have been come out on this. And I have gone through more into the newspapers of the time, I found that they used the keywords, key terms, rebellion, revolt, fanatism, and feminism. It's very interesting that I'll go to that, you know, how they describe the Mapala woman. They were telling that Mapala women are feminists. And Mapala Amazons, you know, they call the region as Mapala Amazon and othering them and considering them as maybe the people living in the Amazon, just animals, though so animals can be killed, you know, it, it nobody would be questioned because the human being of the land has to be killed because they are uh, living people in the Amazon. They are not cult cultured people or they are not even considered as a human being in colonial constructs. Most of the books, because we had two periods, we had period of uh, colonial period. Then we have a post-colonial period. We found a lot of writings, especially Conrad Woodrow and Stephen Dale. You know that. I don't want to name all the things, you know. N number of books came out and studies came out. They all used these colonial terminologies. Even post-colonial writings were using colonial terminologies. Even the books written, the famous 
others, uh, maybe the respected professors who we admire and love, they also use the same terminologies, maybe from the colonial hangover that you know they use this rebellion, they use this revolt. Because I don't think that what is a rebellion in English? It should be against a, 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 a authority that is uh, uh, approved by the people. Because this is this is not a, British, not an authority for us. You know, they were invaders. Invaders, the the maybe uh, the struggle against the invaders never can be a rebellion from our side. You know, actually, it can be a uh, resistance. You know, we 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 never call it. We we are not the rebels. You know, it, it is not the rebelling. You know, uh, we I in the decolonial historiography, I argue that. The word rebellion cannot be used in the sense that we native was when we describe our own history and also the revolt. And even most of the Malayalam book we wrote that Malabar Kalabam. And also later on, you know, even uh, their terminolo terminologies are very interesting. Sometimes they used uh, for our um, massacres that happen in the wagon, wagon, because we use that wagon tragedy, you know, because they want to highlight that as a tragedy because they really massacred the people and they blamed the wagon that it has new, newly painted, you know, because everybody knows that. Then they were uh, just blaming the paint of the wagon for death of uh, uh, around 100 people there in the wagon. This happened. Then we, in our terminologies, you know, in post-colonial terms, even maybe, we you know, we still ourselves use that wagon tragedy hall and all the things, you know, it has to be changed in the colonial sense. Um, okay, let's go next one. It is being operated. Okay, okay, thank you. Take your time. Our technical team is being helping us. Yeah, just uh, these are some of the newspapers I have just mentioned that maybe, you know, you all doing research on the area, this Englishman, November 3, 1921, Maple Amazon, because just to show you, you know, the place, because I found this uh, in British Library because they have got a new manuscript, this uh, section for newspapers. These are available there, the full newspaper. I just uh, took that, highlight the part of the news that they call this Maple Amazon. And you will see that uh the the rounding up rebels and the Khilafat king and i have a disagreement uh, in sense of decolonial historiography that calling king ali muslihar as a king and not only ali muslihar they call different people in different time as king in, because they want to establish that they are fighting with big people uh here and they they are against uh, the real king because they're king they're king, king in england or in uk so they have to show that uh, there is a king emerging here and they need to fight against him so just to show that you know the, how the terminologies were used in the newspaper of the time okay let's go to the next Yeah, post, when we talk about the struggle of post-colonial historians to move beyond the colonial constructs, there was a struggle. I really felt that, you know, they had some issues of in post-colonial era, maybe for decades, for uh, five, more than seven decades after the independence, you know, we have we were facing the struggle to go beyond the post-colonial things or colonial historiographical terminologies. So I will show you that, you know, how this is, you know, that 77 Mapla rifles, if they took the picture in 1907, at that time, they were highlighting that uh, cap, they were giving special cap to them and they never called these Muslims, you know, who were fighting for the British. They never called them fanatics. Every word, this kind of uh, double standard is there from the British side. Only they call Muslims fanatics when they are not supporting British. Uh, now, just I show the photo that, you know, how <laughs> they were using these uh, uh, Muslim uh, fighters for them and accommodating them as they part. This is the one of the photos available there. Let's go to the next. Yeah. 
yeah and uh, this is another one uh, because they are, they distort a lot of things and uh, you will see that you know this is also in sphere this is a newspaper october 15 1921 this picture i saw i found that they wrote that a typical mopla a muhammadan malabaris you see this picture you know we know we all know that this this is not a malabari mopla from the region this was the structure of the reports they give they were they were giving this kind of whatever they got they just uh, maybe published and we can we can see this kind of uh, maybe distortions and uh, moreover <clears throat> not factual things you know they were not fact checking some of the things it's still available over there so uh, we the new new people you know we new people who study this we have to challenge the colonial distortions and in the community alliances they were never highlighted <clears throat> sorry in the in their community alliances and sacrifices by the people let's go to the next one maybe you can click on once again it will come because it's uh, if you click two times it will come over there because it's just like animation okay inter community alliances yeah this is very interesting that you know because all the time they accuse that uh, malabar people are fanatics and they are telling that uh, because i found it i didn't show to you that i found a letter because last year i was in uh turkey for doing some archival research in the taki archives i found that one letter written from malabar in uh, 1914 one moidin musliar from tanur he wrote a letter to a king of uh, uh, ottoman that he is sending some pounds collecting from the people of malabar to support him because he was in trouble after the balkan war at that time and he is sending the money and he is sending it from the shim to the british bank you know that before that british don't have an issue with them and uh, they allowed the people to send the money or communicate with them during that time then later on when british became enemies with them or they are telling that this is very interesting that you know a delegates from patriarch because they are telling that this christian delegation from turkey they came to Uh, malabar and muslims of malabar accepting them because <laughs> putting this picture you know showing showcasing this picture they are telling that muslims are malabar people are with they are because malabar there is only not only muslims you know in the all the uh, st struggles and fights and resistance muslims and hindus were together but uh, the british documents especially the newspapers and other official documents they narrated that you can see that uh, this picture was shown it was highlighted to see to showcase how malabar people or malabar muslim especially muslims were linked to ottoman how they are trying to bring the ottoman rule or uh, or khilafat to malabar they were showcasing this picture the picture of the christian patriarch from there who visited malabar this kind of meager evidence has it it don't have any kind of may be linkage or the factual uh, connection with the malabar muslims because malabar muslims are not part of the christian dominance uh, who live in uh, turkey you know this is something related to something else so so this is the photo they show that the malabar muslims uh, affiliations or connection with uh, ottoman empire and turkic sultan you know they were even using this uh, christian images because any anything what they have because they don't have any other image nobody from turkey visited directly over there they don't have such images so they even showcase this and also you know in christian community there were they were not uh, maybe accepting them british were against and they were uh, according to their uh, perception this was out of their uh, boxes okay let's go to the next
Yeah, because uh, you know that we have only a limited time and I will uh, shed light into some of my findings and arguments and we will discuss later on. This is another thing that the key controversies because we have been <laughs> making, uh, because it's very controversial in Kerala after the centenary celebrations, the people were celebrating the one picture as that of Wadi uh, and Kunya Ahmadaji and it was not shown to the people, it was not into the public at the time. And fortunately, I had that uh, copy of the magazine from French library. And I I found that it is not mentioned that the photo is that of uh, Kunya Ahmad Haji in that. Then I revealed it at that time and it, there was a lot of issues, you know, a lot of friends or the researchers and even the general public, they were not accepting that. And also some of them were even not uh, tolerant to hear those kind of things. And some of my good friends, they told me to do more research and find who is uh, who are the other two in the photo. So I have gone through a lot of archival materials. And when I when I, I want to tell you the background of this picture, you know, because this is a propaganda story written by a military officer to uh, substantiate uh, the British atrocities in Malabar and telling to the uh, people who are living in Europe that you know what we have done in Malabar, same the French and Belgium doing in some part of Africa, nothing else we have done over there. You kill the people in Africa, we also kill same, uh, we do the same what you do uh, in Africa. You know. This is an article they have written for the French audience and showcase to them that what British has done is just the norms that applicable what French has done in their colonies. So in that they have uh, uh, brought out these two pictures, but they mentioned specifically the center image that Ali Musliyar, they mentioned Muhammad Ali, the Ali Musliyar names, but most of our documents uh, never may be described Ali Musliyar's real name, Muhammad Ali, but I had got an opportunity to meet many times Muhammad Ali Musliyar, the grandson of Ali Musliyar, he told me personally that his name got from his grandfather because his mother named his grandfather name to him. So Ali Musliyar has a, got a specific name that Muhammad Ali Musliyar. Then uh, because the book came out with the photo, it was telling that the Ali Muhammad Ali, the Muhammad was to Wadi Gundan because he, somebody called Kunya Ahmad as Muhammad and it has to be taken granted. Then I went through that, you know, what in which context this photo was published. So we can see that this court photo was published uh, to legitimize the British actions in Malabar. Uh, let's go to the next one and uh, we will get uh, maybe more, more ideas from there. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, before that, I would come, I want to come uh, conclude with that because uh, this, this, uh, the earlier picture, you know, the picture that we have seen, uh, the description of that picture was also highlighted in the documentary film. You know that there was a documentary film also made by British because the story of this, uh, uh, maybe the massacres or the atrocities British has done in Malabar, because as, as I mentioned to you that, uh, that Collector Thomas and Hitchcock, they were having some special uh, plans in Tirula Nadi because they want to prevent for the processions and the actions the people, Tirula Nadi people did against the collector in Calicut and they planned everything but you know the officer Nap he told he gave some good directions to these two officers they told he told them you can go and uh, catch the people in the list, listed people but never ride the mosque never uh, enter the mosque and never ride in the Khilafat office of Sri Nadi. But they reached the morning 20th August and they they violated these, uh, maybe the mentions that they got from Madras presidency and they entered all the places. They finally even, they could not even arrest all the people. They found that Ali Muslihar is not there, Lavakuti is not there. And they found only three uh, normal people from the region and the people who went there, then afternoon, all of them, including Ali Musliyar and uh, his all subordinates, they just marched to uh, Kacheri, Tiruyangadi Kacheri, now the new taluk office, uh, now it's uh, uh, 
uh, our museum, uh, district museum. So they marched to there and uh, at that time, uh, they want to substantiate uh, their earlier uh, telegrams and messages they constantly sent to uh, the Madras presidency and they tried to fire to the people and no, no number of people were died. And uh, they accused that, you know, these two who are in the two sides of Ali Musliyar who instigated or signaled the rebellion, they call the rebellion, the revolt uh, by killing two British officers. We know that uh, Rowley and Johnson, two young officers, uh, unfortunately, they, they died over there. So what is important is that uh, when we go to the British documents, we can see that in some places, even uh, Hitchcock and even uh, the other reports came in the recent days, you know, after 20, uh, 20th of August, they have, there are reports on 21st, 22nd, 23rd, till 25th, there are many reports coming, uh, going to the uh, Madras from here. It says that in some reports, they accuse that uh, these officers, these two young officers who already died, they're accusing all the all the atrocities over them and they're telling that these uh, two officers, they are responsible for the uh, atrocities happened over there. You know. So the blames, even these two officers, the collector and collector Thomas and also the police superintendent Hitchcock, they were there enough to blame their own subordinate who passed away in that clashes to escape themselves from the clutches of uh, the law. Then they asked to have a martial law over there. If there was no martial law, I'm sure that there will be another investigation and it will reveal what was really happening in the region and it will go back uh, to them and it will be hitting uh, them and there will be another story. There would be another story uh, in that case. So this was happening over there. So. I found that uh, in some of the reports, they really specifically mentioned who signaled the war, who did the first hit on Rowley, who has who killed these things. You know, so I I could find two names they specifically mentioned. One is uh, Kunji uh, Mr. Kunji Kadar from Tanur and Lavakuti from Tiruvannadi, because uh, there are some arguments. You know, Kunji Kadar did not come to Tiruvannadi. It is there. Some of some some people wrote it that he was caught from uh, Pandaranadi and all the things. But in British document, they are specifically mentioning that uh, he came over there and he it, he was part of that. And this can be seen in the verdict against him, you know, because uh, the martial uh, court had a verdict against him. That's uh, the report. We can see that what he has done and what is accused on him. So in this case, I have to tell you that. Uh, because this photo is taken from a British document and British propaganda articles. So we have to legitimize or we have to find, uh, it, it has to be connected with the, even the British uh, accusations at the time. So I could see that this is not, this has nothing to do with the uh, uh, Kunyamad Haji. And when you go to the deeper things, you know, you can see that Kunyamad Haji was not in the picture in uh, August 28, his name was not in the list of uh, to arrest the people. He was not there. And even you go to all the, mm. because in August 30th is tomorrow, you know, the Ali Muslim was arrested and his subordinates were arrested. Uh, in that list, you know, in that list, uh, you cannot see the name of uh, Kunya Ahmad Haji. And moreover, I could find that uh, uh, the, the film, the documentary film, it was published with the same narratives and uh, same descriptions of these two people and Muhammad Ali, that means the Ali Muslia, it, it came out earlier uh, before Ali Muslia was, sorry, uh, before Kunyamad Haji was caught by British. So there are some uh, advertisement of this uh, documentary published in, uh, at that time, uh, some of the magazines published from uh, America, it was before January 5th. And also they specifically mentioned what, that this film was produced and also previewed to Lord Willington and 
uh, some other officials. So it is clear that this was uh, this photo was taken, this film was produced, and these descriptions were made before the Kunyamad Haji was uh, arrested or caught. Uh, just for some descriptions on these things. And let us go back to the another uh, historical terms they used. You know, they were using the, fan the, the fanatic and also some kind of uh, words that uh, uncultured and those kind of words were used. But at the same time, in the 1921 September, they published this picture of Arakal Kingdom with uh, the governor of French, you know, because French governor visiting Arakal King. And this is the picture, you know, then this, this can be seen, you know, all the British colonial attributes were just to satiate or just to prove they were right. But we can see these kind of lot of other materials. It's contrary to their arguments. But just to show you, you know, how these uh, they were in one end, you know, supporting the Muslims, and on another end, they were drastically or very badly blaming Muslims as uh, maybe uncultured. Okay, let's go to the next because I will finish quickly and we will go to because we have we have to finish it now. It's half an hour. Yeah, we have to see that this is the Chiriangadi Mosque at the time and <laughs> uh, everything happened over there in this picture because later on the, the architecture you will see that how it was uh, integrated or indigenized to the culture of the places. It was a beautiful mosque and later on, you know, it's, we made a Saudi mosque over there. Highlighting the stories, yeah, so solidarity was sacrificed were because I have a lot of stories from my native place, my village, my from my, my, my neighbor, how they admired these things. And I'm not going deep into that. When we have a discussion, you know, I will cite more things. Let's go to the next. Yeah, this is uh, because I could find uh, some of the early writings because uh, this is a letter I found from Wengera uh, that one person from Ch uh, Chalam, they wrote Chalam, Salem, the old name of Salem J Jail, you know, the prison he wrote and what is atrocities going on there. And uh, this uh, landlord of the region, they were Muslims and I found the diary of the uh, lady who was... Uh, the name was Tita Chuma, the daughter of uh, the great poet uh, Chakiri, Chakiri, great, great poet of Chakiri. So she learned Mal Malayalam from her home and the poet taught her the language and she has a good diary. I could, I went through the long back in, long back in 2000, I could find that when we were looking to the history of the region, I went to their home and I could find that diary and she specifically wrote that this is a Muslim family they forced to leave their home because these uh, people, those who were uh, maybe the resistance movement people they approached them, their home and they tried to catch them because they were in the side of British because you know they were Adhikaris of the region and they left their home and the, on their way back she's writing that we went to Mamburam we went to Mamburam and uh, we met the uh, Khatib of the Mamburam and asked, you know, we are in trouble. We are traveling now to Parapanangadi to get an asylum over there. So he asked them to recite two uh, Yasin, two Yasin every day, one for her, one for her husband. Uh, two Yasin, recite two Yasin every day uh, uh, to the Badiringal or the respected uh, people. And she has written in her, she has <clears throat> written all the uh, details of the Yasin she was <laughs> reciting. And she engaged one local mullah, local person, local ulama or local mullah. She entrusted him to recite for her because in the earlier time, you know, they, they were not reciting themselves. They asked the mullah to recite for her and they gave one ana to him for reciting that one and she is mentioning that I have been giving my part and my husband 
giving his part to this mullah for reciting two yasin every day and moreover she is mentioning that after death of my husband my son punyali is giving the money for his for, for her uh, husband you know for the sake of her husbands still they continue reciting that so this will show as that you know this is not just uh, hindus who are uh, in trouble you know, those who supported the british uh, never uh, this without any discrimination nobody looked their religion nobody looked their caste or language this was only the criterion whether they support the british if they support the british if they are muslims or non muslims they will be captured or they will there will be atrocities or there will be some actions against them that happen this is uh, what we can see in those the regional documents that never been highlighted in any of the earlier writings you also will have you know your own treasuries and maybe the stories and these kind of letters from your own region so this is just an instance to showcase that how uh, these kind of things worked in that time and it can be seen you know because we highlight uh, always the two deaths in tirunelveli before that people first killed uh, uh, inspector moidin you know he was a practicing muslim he, he himself says that i removed my shoes to enter the tirunelveli mosque and he was very respect he was very respecting his religion but you know people Uh, were not looking to religion people looked whether he support british or not you know because he was the one first died in tirunelveli from the side of the british allies let's go to the next let's go to the next slide yeah just i will conclude here and we will go to some of the discussion because i don't want to talk more you know let us hear from you also because you all are i know most of them you work in the same area and you will have more insight uh, on the same subject so there are a lot of takeaways from decolonial perspective these kind of things you know i found that there was amity even in between these kind of issues because later on you know still we live in the region harmoniously we have we don't have any religious discrimination and when we take into the consideration tirunelveli and also mamburam you know it has a very deep rooted history of communal harmony that related to kaliyattakavu everybody we all know that we enjoy that one and even all most of the other small temples that also has this kind of stories and even the mosque has got stories that how non muslims has supported the mosque uh, during the earlier time in the region so this kind of number of stories are there so when we decolonize the history we can see that in decolonial historiography the how many between the community is very much highlighted it it is specific in the region and still you know still people call even non muslims call mamburta tangalai or even every year this kaliyattaka will seven start from there it's it cannot be maybe uh, washed out by this uh, colonial historiography and also post colonial historiography propaganda could not affect this decolonial the real mindset of natives the integrated mindset of the natives indigenized mindset of mindset of native so i think we have to decolonize these things and uphold the real warmth of a uh, friendship that we keep in the region that's the story i'm talking this and in my book uh, i have the two sessions the first session i'm talking about from uh, mahatma gandhi to musli arking i don't like to use the musli arking because it's a uh, terminology that used the british to showcase how ali musli are has to be killed you know because i never never in malabar called ali muslihar as a king he was a muslihar papa he was a muslihar papa only you know the the veteran veteran muslihar everybody considered him like that so this is what is there thank you so much for um, being with and i would like to hear more and uh, we will discuss further thank you thank you i think you can we can have a discussion now and uh, pashaya can we start off with the discussion uh, okay sir sure
sir there are no questions on the chat box yet uh, but we have a raise hand option okay. by rajeshwari rajeshwari yeah. please Rajeshwari. Hello, Rajeshwari. There is no response from Rajeshwari, so uh, uh, we I can think, have yeah. a discussion on it. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, is uh, Professor Dineshan responding. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll try to respond. Uh, uh, my voice is very, uh, I'm, I'm uh, difficult to talk in English. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Abbas, uh, uh, for uh, your presentation. And congratulations for coming up with a uh, new book on, on uh, the colonial historiography of Malabar systems. Uh, it's a pleasure, pleasure to join uh, you, especially. Uh, and uh, we actually organized this talk in the context of the release of your book. And it is going to be published by Bloomsbury, right? Yeah, yeah, Bloomsbury. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we know that in the last uh, three, four years, like from nine to, uh, to 2021 to this day, we have been getting more than, um, say, we are, we, are, we are getting uh, so many books on uh, Malabar resistance. I think there are more than one, 100 books uh, published so far regarding it. In addition to books, uh, we are also uh, getting films, uh, painting, and many other other things. And it is in the context you are coming up with the word book. Uh, uh, what I felt is that, uh, of course, you are, you are trying to uh, uh, de uh, de uh, present a decolonized version of historiography. Uh, but uh, the central question which you have been uh, uh, discussing here, at least at least in the presentation, is around the question of whether they are, whether the people are whether, whether the people of the Malabar or Malabar people are were uh, secular or not, and you wanted to emphasize that they were secular to the core, and they were uh, joining together, they were sharing together, and things like that. That's well taken. But uh, my my question is: uh, Is that sufficient to, uh, by providing uh, by pro uh, providing such an answer? They were secular to the core. Will that provide a, a sufficient uh, condition to argue that the kind of historiography, kind of history you are writing, or the historiographic exercise you are making, is actually decolonial historiography? That's the uh, first question I would Secondly, uh, secondly uh, uh, without addressing the um, various kinds of books which are published uh, in the last three, four years, say, uh, as I already told, nearly 100 books have been published on uh, Malabar resistance. Without addressing uh, the context for uh, 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 publishing such works, uh, so the context may have much more importance rather than the content which they were uh, discussing. So how do we address these contexts? And if you are addressing the context of the production of the new literature on Madhabar, uh, what will be the uh, uh, kind of knowledge which we are getting? These are the two things which I would like to uh, uh, present before you uh, for your comments if you can. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this uh, very academic and interesting question. Actually, 
uh, maybe we have been going to different uh, books, you know, Conrad Wood and maybe still Stephen Dale. And then we have uh, in English, you know, when we look into the English uh, books, maybe we have Ken Panika, uh, the last one uh, that from the one of the famous publications. And we have a number of others from the local publications or uh, other journals in our area. I could find that most of them, you know, uh, whatever I have gone through, because I have literature review done in this in this book, so I have found that most of them used all the terminologies that prepared and propagated or established by these uh, colonials at the time. They use the same terminology, even though we argue the other way uh, about the incidents. So I found that even new books, new books who wrote to defend the resistance people, you know, they use the same uh, terminologies. And it can be seen even in the letter uh, the, of the, uh, it was the part of parcel of the life, you know, the letter written by Varian Kunan Kunyahamadaji to the Hindu newspaper. In that, even the letter, we'll see the rebel, you know, the word rebel. So it was part of the culture and the language, you know, because the British, had such an influence in the people to use this. It is still there because the most of the book written later on, you know, I have gone through uh, and I found that, you know, this is uh, one or the other way we were using those kind of uh, legacies. We could not come out of that after uh, decades. And uh, the second uh, question uh, that uh, you are talking about, uh, the in, in the religious things, you know, I could see that because the maybe the Stephen Dale was the first one to uh, relate all the events of resistance to the 16th century, you know. So we have a Kali Muhammad. He has written he has written about the Chaliam War at the time. He is telling there is a famous wording from his side that uh, when Muslims and Nair uh, together were fighting in Chaliam, he wrote that. Uh, he, when Muslims were fighting Hindu soldiers, Naya soldiers, they told that, no, no, you are minorities. We don't allow you to fight and die. You know, first we will die, then only we will allow, allow you to fight and die. These kind of uh, specific uh, things were written during the time, but it was not highlighted that much, you know, because those studies, that one, you know, these studies uh, never get highlighted how it was united. And you can see that also this, uh, when during the Chalian War, uh, the Zamorian, he was fasting because the Zamorian told that I, I will fast till I get it back, the uh, fort of Chalian. And his mother called a meeting, the meeting of Muslim scholars and leaders. It was held in Calicut Mosque in uh, Kutichara. And she was taking initiative to have a meeting. In that meeting, after that meeting, this kind of literature came and instigate the people, all the Muslims, and telling them that to fighting or doing jihad for the country is the religious obligation for you. Uh, because all the time from 16th century onwards, we have only the document from that time. We will see that Muslims were in the world. No, nowhere in the world we could see that. This is a very unique model for us that Muslim doing jihad or fighting, sacrificing their life to protect the reign of their non-Muslim king. This happened over there. And when we come to these uh, uh, details of the letter in, in 1920 and 21, I just mentioned that in a Fukuoka incident, when Tirumulpadu was in a trouble because the Muslim uh, person who is head of these Congress and Khilafat is asking the money back because some money was owed uh, 300 something, you know, he don't know. Uh, money with him at that time. He told, I will give it tomorrow. No, no, he needed it uh, at that night. Otherwise, uh, they are afraid something will happen. Then who is giving the money? Two Muslim land tenants of this same landlord. Same landlords, two Muslim tenants giving money to settle the issue. That was highlighted as the prelude of prelude of the rebellion, you know, because people telling that this is the prelude of the rebellion that created all the atrocities and communal clashes in Malabar. This was, but 
who settled it nobody highlighted this earlier that two muslim ten tenants you know they were bringing the gold from their home to protect uh, tirumul pad of kokotur on the day it was not highlighted or mentioned these kind of number of stories are there because i know a lot of time we highlight the issue of kaliga vankaru those issues you know in because we can see that they travel because it's also mentioned by can panikar i think they travel uh, many they they covered many villages you know to to kill that one person or one family who were supporting british even in their way there were uh, other religious groups you know but later on it was highlighted that they were uh, going to kill only one community because this was highlighted everywhere because we have to read uh, read again and reread how they hided when the muslims were attacked uh, by the Uh, people protesters you know that i told you this story of uh, the uh, inspector moidin is a good story you know never highlighted that he was a practicing muslim and he was the one first died before rawli and johnson in uh, tirunelveli there are number of other stories when you look into tirunelveli even uh, ch press you know this famous that they the the people burned their press and th when british were going back to calicut these two three families that adigari is their family is still there they all the, the muslims who were supporting british from tirunelveli they also were taken by the british with them you know everywhere these kind of things are there so it cannot be as colonial historiographers mentioned and post colonial historians colonial historians mentioned this as a, a clash of muslim hindu things you know it was but let on post colonial uh, terms you know we were using same terminologies of this kind of uh, fanatism and rebellion even even i can see that the bands you know they were telling that the bands what the bands that nagara they used in the most because at the time there was no loud speaker they used in nagara british just compare this as bands in many places because my book was first uh, i sent to some of my colleagues and friends from usa they they told what you mean the band you know? because british mentioned these as a band and also they are uh, telling that feminism that's very interesting that you know the muslim women are dressed like men in pokotur because they killed a, some some of the women in pokotur you know then they want to uh, uh, maybe justify it they are telling that they were dressed as men because of that we killed but there are some other incident you know one woman she was shielding her uh, in uh, is her father uh, he was old and she, then she was a young, young young girl she was also shot dead there by this military and to maybe to justify all the things they were telling and they were telling that they were feminist you know the feminism has to be redefined in that sense and i found that during that time in britain women don't have the full right to vote and even we because we know that even women got very later to go to the universities there so in that sense feminism was also bad term and also using these you know amazons making the uh, malabar as a amazon uh, kind of uh, world and uh, maybe to act against them these kind of things are seen over the i think uh, we need more more research on these okay thank you <laughs> maybe no i'm taking longer time no may i intervene us yeah yeah please please most welcome i want to hear from you especially <laughs> you have done a lot of studies on the field and you have been working yes. one is that you know i don't know whether the you are falling into the same trap as the colonial rulers binaries you are trying to reverse the binary that is one problem because they are trying to you know present you from the from the entire resistance from the point of view of a mopla revolt and you are sort of sort of trying to tell us that you see they are the muslims are not the same as what the colonials portrayed them as you know that is what i think professor dinesan was asking whether is that the way to look at things that is one whether you are trying to reverse it's a question of empire writing back it is fine <laughs> you see 
you can always have the empire writing back and but the empire writing writes back in its, its own terms so what is that term in which one should write back that is one problem because i had some uh, occasion i was teaching in you know you must be knowing i was teaching I know, I know. at calicut university and uh, I, know, I, know. I know i had some contact i had done a project to tiruvannadi for some time Yeah. then i actually when then talk to people i talked invariably about rebellion in various ways yeah and this this resulted in me two kinds of responses which i think is very interesting primarily because when you are talking about writing back you see these two responses seem to be quite interesting one is that you know the respondents particularly old men very old people and they are not also people not who actually lived during the time of rebellion they are basically descendants of somebody who then and they actually learned it from their parents basically and now from them i got you know two terms which they were repeatedly saying one is called lahalakar and the other is kollaka this distinction between lahalakar and kollaka is something that it struck me very strongly primarily because of the fact that lahalakar are people who actually res were as you said resistors yeah who who fought against the british and the, interestingly the british are never mentioned by them saipamar and the saipamar is a as a category which they have never seen they have seen only some sai pose going in a horse on the horse back somewhere and there is also a very interesting story about you know the children running into scene tirangadi a madama going in a horse back so they, they were all struck by a woman sitting on a horse back and there there is a big story except this uh, this madama and this one or two europeans they have never seen a europe so this european is actually a category which is not is invisible until until the army stepped in and the army stepped in when the army stepped in they were not seen the armies they were seen the gorkhas gorkha patal yeah. always the story talked about gorkha patal and the gorkha patal and the patala camp there is also a place called even now called patalam in near calicut university near your kaliyattaka and uh, that area patala parambu is called and that you see where the patalam some supposed to have camped now the point is that this kurka patalam so the, the the very question of colonialism as we say as we say the oppressive character of colonialism is something that is invisible to a large number of people and the resistance to place in spite of this invisibility because the the problem with them was that their own misery their own that is what people were keep repeatedly talking about you know their famine conditions their misery their extreme poverty their taalam tagare endu jeevikkam see this is what keep kept on repeating you know when you talk about places where taalam tagare nundi jeevikunna avastha and this is something that kept on repeating so this is what which resulted in the resistance that is what i felt so the lahalakar were people who were supporting them i mean they didn't bother about who this lahalakar were they were muslims non muslims those, those categories and not there but kollakar were people who were trying to plunder them. and and there are this distinction was clearly made which i thought to as a different which give gives you a very different kind of a narrative from what probably the british tried to portray and probably what the colonial historians were the what you call as post colonial historians are also right this is one thing so this is one interesting thing so the question of muslim non muslim etc etc you see doesn't come because primarily because of the fact that you see there is a whole range of stories which came from parappanangadi which talked about the marakkars who are trying to protect the 
the Parappanad family, the royal family, from the Kollakar. Remember, these terms are very important. What I said, Kollakar were trying to plunder the Parappanad family and the Marakkars were protecting them. So, which means that you have got Marakkar. Later on, I found out that, that they were referring to Marakkar as the Naha family, basically. Basically, the Naha family were called the Marakkar. So, later on, when, when I inquired further regarding who the Marakkas were, they were talking about Naha family. Then they were pointing out to various Nahas. So, this, again, the point, what were the Naha family doing in this entire uh, resistance is something that is that should be looked into. That is one. So, this is something which, which I thought was very interesting, primarily because of the fact that you don't have a composite Muslim community in that sense. We have a set of people who are resistors, who are fighters, and there are people who might have made, made use of this fight in this uh, uh, unsettled conditions in various ways. So, these fighters were, and the fighters were anti-British, and they are the people who are remembered. Not the not the other people. They are the people who are remembered. So therefore, I think I think from the people's point of view, people's resistance. I think one should look at it from this point of view. Instead of you see, be getting tagged on to the colonial narrative of the Muslim. Yeah. You see, that is one thing which I think is very important. If we get tagged on to the colonial narrative of the Muslim and trying to respond to it all the time. See, you you try you get you actually get trapped into the same kind of narrative, colonial historiography, instead of decolonizing it. This is something that you should look at. I don't know why. This is my personal this impression that I got, which I am trying to tell the uh, converse. That is why this question of secular, non-secular, you know, you see, these things are to me irrelevant because the, 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 see the question of secularism, etc., doesn't appear to the people at all. They don't they don't bother about it. They don't think in terms of secularity. That is why Mampadam Tangal tradition is very strong. Mampadam Tangal tradition is very strong primarily because tra that tradition gave them the impetus to fight against the Muslim colonialism. Whether, whether they call it as colonialism or something, that gave them the impetus to fight against colonialism. That is something which I thought which is very interesting. And <clears throat> finally, there is uh, one more thing which I which is regarding, you see, Hindu-Muslim thing. I'm, I'm not going into details. I found that majority of the respondents, sorry, majority of the respondents never talked about Hindu. They, they, were, they were thinking in terms of caste, not a composite religion. So, so for example, Muttadattu Namburari, who were there, they ran away. Muttadat is a Namburi family who was there. They ran away. They ran away. They never tried to face this thing and they ran away. But Nair's settled and Nair supported the British. So where is the Hindu there? Some people ran away. Nair supported the British and the others, particularly the Tiyas and others, the lower caste, all supported the resistance. What does it mean? Does it mean a Hindu-Muslim kind of thing? Or does it mean something very, very different? This is something that one has to look into. When you talk about secularism, Hindu-Muslim, inter-community relations, etc., etc., there is a problem of this, you know, whether with the present narrative or the Hindu, I'm talking about the Hindu narrative against the Muslims. I'm talking about that. In order to count, we have to counter that also. This is a kind of another kind of, you see, oppressive regime. So, so that means that you have to look into this fashion, whether there was a category called Hindu. Now the point is that the category called Hindu was used by actually the Congress. The Congress leaders communicating with the Khilafat leaders. They were the people who were using Hindu and not the ordinary people. So this is something which you have to look into. So the, when you talk about I think it has to be more qualified. That's what I think. Thank you so much. It's uh, very in interesting, uh, especially the what you cited, you know, because I have uh, mentioned in the book in the first, you know, especially the first Gandhi's visit and Hilafar, it was not uh, necessary in uh, terms of Malabar or Kerala, you know, because 
this was a North Indian norm that Hindus and Muslims are different groups and they cannot join in contest without the Khilafat movement or some, some agenda of Khilafat. It was a mistaken things from Gandhi and Shaukat Ali and they were bringing the North Indian norms to Kerala and it was not necessarily there. there it was later on used by British. There was no need of even Khilafat committees in the region. Because the, all the people together, Muslims or non-Muslims, whoever there, you know, they were good friends. You know the story, we know the story of MP Narayana Manan and Katila Sheri and all the people. Everybody had their own close friends, you know, family friends or the childhood friends, you know, they never looked their religion as we look nowadays. So this may be importing Khilafat movement to Kerala, or at that time Malabar was not at all a necessary thing, you know, it was a fault in my sense that that they have done in North Indian sense. I have mentioned that in the book, that the first uh, things happened here, British later on used it uh, to classify Muslim as Khilafatas and they want to bring uh, the uh, Turkish <laughs> Khilafat to India, a separate uh, Turkish one, not with Muslim Hindus and other things, you know. And also, this is very important things that you mentioned, the halakkar and also the attackers, you know, the two kind of, the kollakar and the halakkar. It is always there because we can see that in the first time when British left, Tiruvannadi, Ali Musliyar was giving good direction that, you know, to, to defend these uh, attackers, you know, because some uh, looters, attackers or kollakar, they were looting some of the houses, especially non-Muslim houses in near uh, Chamar region and uh, he sent his people to protect those houses that can be uh, visible, that's very visible and uh, even these kind of uh, things were mentioned, you know, because it's everywhere we can, when we go to, even in the letter of Kunya Ahmadaji, we can see that Kunya Ahmadaji is telling that, you know, who is converting the people are not my people, they are the people sent by the British, you know, British had also intruded in among us and they are the people they are converting i have no idea or i my people will never do that you know though. and also another issue that when the august 20th when british team reached there uh, to arrest the people of tiruvannadi the listed people for arrest uh, tiruvannadi the letters were reached you know there were some envoys reached in vengara um, and also um, Kotakel, they knew that early morning, when the British reached there, somebody came there and they informed them there is something happening there, you know. Then we can see another narratives, the uh, decolonial or the native narratives, we can see that it was from the British side, you know, they were also sending people to <laughs> inform the people over there and they had put the police barricade, the military barricade in the area that uh, people enter from Kotakal and Vengara to Tiruvangadi, you know, these were very strategically planned by them and they were working just in the modern war technology, how they work, you know, with these kind of uh, meager tactics. So their people were intruding among these people. And some of the things are not even mentioned by them, you know, because they were uh, even uh, death of, maybe you can talk uh, on that also, maybe the death of uh, Levakuti because they hanged him after uh, and they they claimed that he is suicide and other things you know this these kind of uh, maybe actions were there from the british side that is uh, very specific and i have mentioned all the things in the book, book you know because i was uh, going through all the things and i found that this was happening over there as you mentioned it's very clear that there were no religious discrimination at all you know and one, one family in Vengara, I, I mentioned that they went away from their home. So these people don't know whether they are inside, you know. So they tortured one person who were a uh, gatekeeper of their family. It's visible, you know. The, the, he was from the other religious backgrounds. It is everywhere, you know, not just, uh, there was no religious segregation as we see nowadays. Or people were not talking about the religious uh, disparities that is also in us books you know he's telling that some of the actions that done by the uh, malabari muslims are not as islamic they do you know they are doing uh, not islamic things that 
in the region, you know, because it was very much integrated society with nerchas and also the matrilineal societies, all the all those kind of norms. So, because then maybe later on the the Arabized or Saudiized terminologies came to our region. Only people think that you know whether we can mingle there or we can do this or that. You know, these are very new. You know, in nineteen twenties, uh, still we don't have these classifications or. Uh, maybe uh, you are right in that case. Thank you for bringing these kind of insights. There are chat box for a few. Okay. Uh, Mubashir has raised numerous questions. I will read them one by one for the convenience of the speaker. Have you explored any archives available locally that deal with intercommunal dimensions? were they free of conflicts? For instance, local correspondences such as Kalasheri and Kadathanada Rekhagal have ample records of strife between Nayas and Mapulas. Yeah, it's interesting that to talk about Kalasheri records, and I have gone through to Bingen to get it earlier. Now it's uh, everywhere online. They have uh, this available online. And it's interesting that all these records were taken by uh, Gundet at the time from our uh, uh, places, and especially it was uh, from the court records. Most of them were the court records. And interestingly, the, we should study, you know, the language they used. It's very interesting, you know, most of the records start with Salam and other things, you know. There was, uh, there were even the uh, normal language, maybe Lal Salam we used in uh, communist sense, that most of these records, we can see that those kind of Arab influences or those kind of language influences in that. And even the language was not, I have a study on that, the language was not even called Malayalam at the time. And I have a disagreement with that also, even we call the region that the Kerala, maybe, you know, it's it, these, these documents are very important. And there are a lot of, it's, it's, uh, the, it's not uh, the debate or the discussion or even the conflict between Muslims and non-Muslims are, are not reflected in this because this were the conflict based on the wealth or some other property rights or something else. Never ever the religion was not at all a matter, you know, uh, because later on only we read this based on religion. It's, it's specific on those things. We can see it's because uh, it's uh, when I come to... Uh, the chairman's uh, doctor uh, Ken Ganesh things you know that's specific that uh, how uh, British dealt with some people you know in different times you know when they uh, go with their alliances and oh when they are against them it can be when they are against only they specifically mention the religion of the people and also when we talk about the history of India you know because the Bill's book only that told that the history of India written by natives. He specifically tried to mention the religion of the people who conquered India, you know. Even the history books, Romila Tapar all mentioned that even the history books written earlier never talked about the conqueror's religion, you know. We are not talking about uh, uh, Britishers as uh, Christians, you know, never talk that. But when the talk about the British, when they talk about the Mughals, they uh, specifically mention the religion. And it is also mentioned by some other, all the scholars, they mentioned that who are opposing these colonial terminologies or colonial uh, historiography that nobody mentioned that uh, uh, when the Sp Spanish people, they conquered, they are the part of America. Nobody told that their uh, uh, religion, you know, we mentioned their language or the specific locality. It's happened, happened all over the history long back, even the Sanskrit uh, documents, when they mentioned about the Mughals, they never mentioned about the religion. These religious centric uh, perceptions or highlighting came by the British colonial historiography, and we still we are in the hangover. And we first, uh, in when we meet, we ask that what is your religion? You know, it was not a matter earlier. So this has to be mentioned when we uh, go to the Talashari diagram and all things. Thank you. Second question by Obashir himself. Can you please elaborate a bit about your method? How is a decolonial method of historiography distinct from other approaches? 
Yeah, that's uh, maybe everybody knows that, you know, because we have been going through uh, uh, colonial things and I have a struggle there, you know, I use most of the colonial document. We have most, we, more documents are from colonial, you know, even in case, because we don't, we have only rare documents and I had got opportunity to, in 2075th uh, anniversary of the uh, resistance, I got opportunity to meet one person in Pukoto. He was alive. He, he was young, 11 years at the time, and uh, I met him during the time. And we don't have much people uh, later on. You know, I met also the daughter of Ali Muslia. Mm, yeah. I could have uh, opportunity to meet her. So these are the traditional things that we have been, or these uh, native resources. Uh, and the other are oral sources. You know, oral sources are some other issues, but. I was trying to read the colonial sources and tr even trying to find uh, the native perspective even in inside the colonial because sometimes they contradict themselves, you know, in one person telling about one incident one way, other person after two days uh, describing it's in favor of uh, uh, his things, you know, it can be seen in colonial things and it is the way we could do decolonize because we don't have other much of the things. And I have also mentioned that because I know one fighter in South Africa, he died at the time of apartheid. And last year, his son is my friend, Professor Harun. His father died in, he was, his father died in the prison. And they reopened the case. And now the, that court, you know, posthumously came up with a verdict against those Britishers or the colonial people who tortured these people. Now this is happening in this world. And I think that this has to be uh, re reconstructed or international court has to be taken these things and because the modern time these kind of things has to be taken out in that way this has to be more modern modern historiography we write for the history and it has to be revealed to the public through other means you know not just writing history it has to be went to the court it has to be analyzed in other ways also that has that has been doing in south african society now Yes. Great question by Mubashir. How do you approach caste among the natives through a decolonial approach? Does it get erased in the grand narrative of colonial versus native? No, this is in historiography. We cannot do that, you know, because already we do that. What is there, you know, what is mentioned over there? The caste system was very prominent over there at the time. But uh, uh, I think in the historiography, what we do that we just uh, take out what we have seen over there. But what what I have done as a native, or I mentioned always that uh, I was trying to evade these kind of uh, language terminologies. Most of those things they used, uh, especially the Lahala. You know, the Lahala was used those kind of many many terminologies which which are very derogatory when we look into our place. But most of the books even favoring to these uh, resistant groups is written using this word, you know. Even I, I mentioned that, you know, even the letter written by Kunyamadaji using the same words like that, as uh, uh, chairman mentioned that, you know, they were proudly talking that Lehalakar, it's a derogatory terminology to use even that time. So I believe that there, because people who were the learned people, they believed that they were with the British. So they were using the terminology that even the people who were resistance, they used the same terminology to identify themselves. You know, it's a pity maybe in that sense. Thank you. There is a comment by Sharat Mirza. The period of 16th century till the end of the 19th century seems to have been a period of domination of one community over the other. He wonders whether there was an attempt to have alliances between such communities. The idea of secularism is an idea that seems to have arrived in the international arena only at the very end of the 19th century. Yeah, we know that secularism and interreligious things, all the terminologies, when I mentioned that in interreligious inter matters and in the cultural affairs, all very new European eyes and terminologies. 
maybe the colonial terminology even the dialogue you know because there are a lot of center here they call dialogue i really oppose with them because dialogue means between two people you know they only see the two religion there you know i told them in india it's not a two religion and even before that uh, uh, Dr. Ken Ganesh mentioned that we were we had more than religion, we had a number of caste over there. So even I told them dialogue don't work with us because I also work in interfaith and interreligious matters. I told them dialogue never work in Indian scenario. We have uh, engagement, you know, we engage more than just you speak, you know. So these kind of uh, things are there, all the terminologies are later on created. And this were not matching. When we talk about the 16th century, all the documents, especially in Malabar, we can see that Muslims were very proudly living under the Zamorian, but they never called him as a Hindu. Maybe they called Amir of Muslims and they prayed for him in uh, Friday sermons. And uh, I could see that uh, the document, everybody is available there. You know, the Sheikh Zainuddin II wrote that if uh, a Muslim culprit, he was... Uh, sentenced to death, Muslim had the privilege to take his body and clean his body and bury it, but non-Muslims were not given the privilege under that king, you know, though he was a non-Muslim. So they told that uh, this king is the best one, maybe, that uh, they have to protect and uh, protect his reign. This is mentioned over there. In 16th century, we have, when we talk about, I don't know, he's from which region, when we talk about uh, Malabar, uh, it was that much uh, prolific in this sense of uh, harmonies. And there is, as you know, the first Islamic text, uh, maybe Islamic law text, Islamic law text for a pluralist society was written in Malabar. You know, there, we cannot see any such a pluralistic, pluralistic test on Islamic law at that time in other world. It was taken to the South Asia, Southeast Asia. You will see that uh, different uh, uh, maybe a translated version in Indonesia, Bahasa Indonesia and Malay language and they are teaching still in their uh, Pesantrans, that madrasa so over there, this text, it was written in 16th century and he mentioned that uh, there is no issue of uh, dealing, a lot of interreligious things can be seen that, you know, he's telling that uh, because at the time we use uh, the floor, you know, we were using the cow dung for the floor Muslim cannot pray on that at least, but he legalized it. You should pray over there, you know. And he tell people there was some discussion, you know, where because all the uh, grains were dried on this uh, floor which used the cow dung. So people was uh, was not uncertain whether it can be used. It all can be used. And also there were a lot of all the partners were Muslims and non-Muslims. So non-Muslims will have some other maybe riba that means uh, interest and other things and he in his uh, own business whether the, they can do together the business he legalized it he finding some reason from other places you know because we have such a great history and a great uh, scholars they uh, maybe preach this pluralism at the time so we have our own terminologies you know not colonial we don't go for dialogue we don't go for interreligious things we have plural pluralistic matters and we have engagement, even in our language, we don't use uh, thank you, you know. We don't have the usage of thank you too much, you know. We give back, we keep in heart and we give back that. Nanni, we don't use the word nanni, you know. It's not even maybe vernacular language. It's sometimes important to us. We keep in, we are, we were the society more engaging with our neighbors and never ever discriminated on the basis of their beliefs. Next question by Arif Ali. How do you understand the transition of Qadi system, especially the one formulated by Zainuddin Makhdooms from colonial period to post-colonial period? Uh, Kali system, I think, in, because still, you know, in Calicut Kalis are still in the same order. <laughs> and though they have followed the matrilineal system, I found that uh, they have matrilineal family names, but uh, because of that issue, you know, Kali's family name always change, you know, because uh, they take uh, in uh, patrilineal lineage to select the Kali, but normally in family, they keep those traditions, still they're keeping over there. But in Ponanistanam, they had a uh, head of 
the places over there it's from matrilineal still because of the inner telling that you know these people are following non islamic things or against quran is mentioning that those who are doing this are against quran at the time so the kali system followed over there and even the first document the kisar sakravarti parmad is mentioning that all the name of the kalis they uh, in, initiated you know they established the kali centers and in all our regions and it has a, a diff different connotation in electronic there was no issue uh, in finding in some place some from other families or other things because they give these uh, right to the community to choose in some places i think this is out of our subject i have not gone deeper into those things <laughs> okay let's go next question by tanzil Nazar, she has also raised two questions. Uh, besides the current conceptualizations of decolonization or decoloniality, how would you define your conceptualization? And one more question. Uh, how do you interpret kingship and sovereignty in your work? Yeah, this is a sovereignty with because you know even in this uh, sovereignty and kingship uh, we had it in malabar long back we revered our kings all the things you know but when it came to the european sense you know it became something uh, very hierarchical and because of that they were using that measures to us and they also need some kings here to fight because of that they brought you know all the names here kilabat kings and other things i have specifically mentioned that and they claimed that there was a sovereignty for uh, ali musliyar in the small mosque of tirudangadi and telling uh, finding some people in especially some witnesses uh, to uh, prove that he be became a king you know because in european sense you know uh, to court martial or to fight with the king you know he should be also a local king in that sense this kind of sovereignties and king kingships in in, uh, in the time of this resistance were just created by british uh, for their legal matters i found it but we had the other kingly options but it was not e explicitly visible because of the european in invasion you know because they love their king and they uh, they are always proud of their king and they, they mention their kings uh, Uh, sovereignty always but they never ever minded the our kings <laughs> and uh, their sovereignty is a double standard from their side that can be seen everywhere next question by vidya khader was this resistance against class exploitation or britishers by nationalists yeah this 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 is a mixed we can when we look into that it it can be a mixed uh, mixture of both you know because uh, those who were with the british especially the landlords all most of the landlords they were with the british so uh, the people were fighting against the british and also these landlords we can see that how they were running around running away from their places and and british i told you that in jirangadi british were taking the landlords with them they blew away or when they defeated in 20th august it's those names were mentioned that then later on they were helping british to come back or to catch or to find these uh, fighters and their uh, special hiding places and all things this can be specific everywhere so we cannot uh, uh, tell that it was just against the british it both happened over there in some cases uh, this is specific from the local narratives and also as i mentioned you know in the diary even though uh, that can be taken as a colonial source like that you know, because the diary written by um, one landlord and we can even see that you know it is written by the chakiri's daughter and we can see in the document that once ali musliyar and his subordinate were called to chakiri's home for a, a discussion and in that uh, chakiri is uh, uh, asking them because he is uh, very influential in chirangadi because uh, he, their family was with uh, mamboran tangal long back and they were taking care of mamboran tangal at that time as his uh, 
good colleague friends or colleagues and uh, they they agreed that they agreed that uh, ali muslim they are told that you know we don't make any trouble and we can see in the all the history historical document that ali muslim was looking for the peace and even when you know, the people the group from calicut they came over there he told also that you know i don't want to make any trouble because if he had killed on 20th august you know that they all the british this collector and uh, thomas collector thomas and hitchcock were inside this kacheri they would be able to even kill them at the night you know but they didn't they only uh, did some kind of reaction when they were attacked at that night they didn't attack them the morning they allowed them to go uh that can be seen over there okay vidya has raised one more question if there were resistance supporters and looters is that differentiation highlighted during the decolonization process in your writings yeah this is a because this was mentioned in it is not just in my writing this is specifically mentioned at the time itself because i raised to those two instances instances one from ali muslim ali muslim uh, mentioning that there are people looting other houses uh, of other religious groups in case of muslims you know he sent these people to protect that other religious uh, groups uh, who were tortured by these looters and it is specific at that time but it was not highlighted later on the historiography and also uh, kunyamaraji himself when he wrote the letter is telling and this is also published in some of the uh, reports in usa uh, at that time and he mentioned that we are not uh, the looters they are telling that there are some people who loot that that is not my party he is mentioning that this is specific earlier but it is not highlighted or in colonial historiography or they neglected these kind of things because it won't give any specific uh, uh, evidence for their own arguments yes please ah. next question by arif ali can we conceptualize carl smith's sovereign concept on pre modern history especially malabar resistance against colonial powers yeah in this sense we can tell that but <laughs> even uh, i will say that you know those who study in you know, a lot of people studying on cars you can see that you know even in my area there were a uh, muslim landlord landlord he was a colonial officer his uh, workers were is uh, the very lower caste because they were just like slaves you know you know earlier time there was at that time we had a slave system over the country and kanakans or such kind of uh, they call our kanakas kanakans because uh, they believe that they bought and they have history that they bought this group from other landlord or their friends or the families sometimes they give them as a present these kind of groups and they give the land in their their home and they all settle over there they work for them without any payment they they were i don't use the force you know they they were maybe believed to be worked and i talked to a lady later on maybe yes back in that community asked why can't you come up and sit with us and eat no no we are not against our belief because there was a belief system also formed inside that groups that they don't go there or they, they have these kind of issues so it it even may be developed as a belief system among them and but these <laughs> groups don't have in some cases you know when they have some other issues they don't kept this kind of aversion or segregation because i told you when these uh, they call lehalakar that the resistance group they came and uh, tried to plunder we they used the word plunder you know because they try to take it over from him because they know that you know he is the one taking the tax for the british they believe that that's our money is there inside they want to take the money out so they went inside uh, to the house and this they want uh, us to the house they ran away from there so at that time when there were some big issues you know these lower caste people were supporting them and some of the lower caste were also with the resistance group because they were related to their families these kind of things are there it may be interesting for a study you know 
later on for some of those who study in caste, you know, how it worked, you know. Because we cannot tell that you know, this specific caste has done this, you know, because more than the caste, I found the attachment and engagements and the earlier relation with the people, you know, how they were protecting is based on their earlier attachments. So more than the caste, their relation worked everywhere. Okay, maybe I'll Nasser. Uh, uh, has asked us to remind uh, Dr. Abbas uh, yes. about his question. That is, uh, in his opinion, you have missed uh, one question by him. That is, I will read, okay, read them for your convenience. Yeah, yeah. Besides the current conceptualization of decolonization, how would you define your conceptualization? How, how would you define your conceptualization? No, it's, uh, I, I will tell that decolonial historiography, you know, because uh, that's only the term that now, nowadays use, nowadays used, you know, in that case, we, we have to, uh, you, I, I like to use that decolonial historiography, especially in case of the languages used and also the terminologies that used. And as uh, we discussed earlier, it can be because, you know, we used to, only we had only that much because it's true, you know, we don't have a lot of other uh, maybe native resources uh, as much as we have in colonial researches. So I was founding, I, I was founding that, you know, I was trying to find that um, how that worked, you know, how they were manipulating the things. And I used most of these colonial uh, sources for this study that maybe somebody can defend in that case, but I was trying to find how colonial archives or colonial documents can be read in the sense of a native historian or native reader. That was the main uh, attempts uh, or prime attempts from my side that I read with the lens of native world. All the books, all the books uh, I have gone through, I have read in native lens. So because of that, I felt a lot of uh, discriminations in their writings and also the, even the reports they they wrote at that time. That will be the answer for myself for that. Next question. One more question by Arif Ali. What do you think the reason for such a cohesive community to be formed against British, Kerala Maplas, against colonial power, irrespective of religion, for example, Muslims under Zamori. Even the word Mapula, you know, it's also, I believe that it's a colonial term. It's really a colonial term, the Mapula, because they want to, they use it very much. I don't like to use it. It's a, really a colonial in decolonial geography. We don't use because it's not the, a Muslim terminology, you know, because we had uh, uh, all other religious groups had used that earlier. But when it comes to the British, colonial terms, you know, they used Mopolas as a synonym for Mohammedans or Muslims. It was there because in some countries, it has some other historic uh, backgrounds. You know, in some countries, Muslims were good allies of uh, British. So they don't want to tell them that we are fighting here against Muslims, you know. So they were telling that these are new caste groups. They are not Muslims. They are not following Quran. They are out of the Islamic box. We want to <laughs> you want to fight with them. This kind of uh, explanation, colonial uh, <clears throat> terms or colonial historiography was there in, uh, during the time that is very specific. And uh, as you mentioned, you know, we can see that in 16th century, we don't have these kind of things. The language, I have a study on that. Even the language, we never call Arabic Malayalam. We never call Jewish Malayalam. We never called uh, this uh, Suriyani Malayalam. We were all calling one name, even uh, the our even the local in my language we call that even the god Padachoni. It's it's the same word used by the lower people also for their god. We never uh, use any other. Even when there is a sudden issue, you know, we call Padachone. That's the sudden reaction. That's the same reaction given by all others in the native. You know, it's uh, it's very specific later on that there was no discrimination at all in that they, they followed a different religion. So 
maybe that's the cohesion was there it was uh, explicit in the society because of that we don't have an issue for uh, going for any ulsabam in our place you know we take all the money for a year long getting from cash units or something in the earlier times they spent there i know i have to tell one incident that when babri masjid was demolished there was a a rot in somewhere that there was incident that some of the muslim groups told that don't go for it was next maybe in that month same month we had a ussava in vengara so we used to go there all the time so uh, in the friday prayer after friday prayer the imam told that don't go for ussava on this year because why he tell that you know we, you know that people all go for ussava it is their tradition everybody goes over there then i found the next in the then i realized that in the morning the mulla of the place he is carrying uh, the we call the jaggery jaggery candy chakramutai he brought in the early morning because he we know that is part and parcel of our life we cannot uh, pass the day without jaggery candy you know so you know that this uh, khatib the head of the mosque will declare that don't go so he brought, went in the early morning i brought it before uh, juma prayer the because it was a sharing society till electron you know after this all turmoil what uh, described by the british you know there was a good cohesion good engagement we all will have our good friends in all uh, communities our neighbors we never have such kind of discrimination so far uh, one more Thank question you. by arif ali Same how do you understand the repeating the questions please check it up it is repeating? not repeated how do you Sorry. understand the pre modern politics against british and can we conceptually call smith's political theology concept here yeah because <clears throat> these are uh, <laughs> no i will tell that you know maybe in my own point of view i always tell that we don't want to maybe when we go to the studies you know they will make the theories and we will be going around that that things and i will tell all the new new researchers uh, or even our colleagues and friends and professors we have to find our own terms and terminologies and we don't want to link our life is very different what they have seen because of that they made these kind of disparities in the their viewpoint i told you that even dialogue or anything any kind of european made terminologies or descriptions that seldom match with uh, our lifestyles because <laughs> because of that even i know uh, the robert personally you know he wrote a letter on this he passed away last last year i i told him very frankly that uh, because of these differences uh, maybe the the life and culture you live we have to find our own measures you know and it has to be upholded it it has to be uh, taken from our own life and we don't match with uh, i this is my personal opinion i never match with any theory of uh, later on described by the others and if even we cannot even i am telling that even in kind of dialogue you know dialogue is a very famous word it is used by all the world, people you know it is un, unknown to us it is it cannot be fit to the society in our place we never dialogue with anybody and it's also two term you know there, there are trilog and other things we are not just two communities muslims or hindus or or christians and others you know these are based on the pre conceptual method ma ex explanations or their societal terms you know so i i will tell that we have to come up come out and we have we should have maybe in future in the colonial historiographic time we will have our own terms and we will have our own historical narratives and also methodologies this should be developed because i think our kerala history uh, this kshr has to take initiative for that and we should develop our own and I, and we have to explain to them we bring them we can bring them because i do work with all these because in my edited volumes you know most of them from harvard and oxford they all contributed they are happy that we have we are going through our own transitions you know in this transition we have to bring them and we, we have to explain them and tell them that you know we have our own differences that our own experiences based on that we have to find our own terms and other things and hopefully we will do that soon thank you there are no further questions on the chat box i think this 
we are also mm -hmm. exiting the time maybe there <laughs> so professor ganesh uh, shall we wind up the program yeah please yeah, we'll, uh, just uh, yeah, i think uh, professor ganesh and... no 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 oh, please uh, I don't have anything, Dinesh. No, I don't have anything to tell. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Uh... One comment. This is only a comment. You don't have to answer this or anything. Because oh, yeah. our problem is that in this kind of debates, which I find immediately, is that, you know, there is an attempt. I mean, uh, first of all, I don't think, for example, 20th century, a 20th century as a resistance of any kind is just a pre-colonial, it is not based on any pre-colonial positions. Because they are they are actually confronting a colonial reality. You cannot you cannot escape from there. So what means that the wins once it is uh, they are confronting a colonial reality, they are trying to find ways and means by which how to resist. So the forms of resistance. You may have to probably probably draw your resources from sometimes from your pre-colonial, you know, uh, mind your resources. That the, is necessary. But at the same time, there is a necessity for, you know, confronting the colonial reality at the same time. So this is the predicament that there were, most of these resistors were put in at that time. I mean, during the time of 19th century, 20th century, all these periods, you find the same thing going on. But there is an attempt by us, particularly the uh, the post-colonial historical, you know, by us to, you know, trace this particular kind of resources as the only fundamental means of resistance. I mean, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about 1857 revolt, for example, which was in fact considered as a Hindu resistance. Yeah. And uh, similarly, there is an attempt by, so the questions that some of the questions that were asked, it seemed to me, maybe I'm wrong. You see, it seemed to me that, so this primordial pre-colonial reality is something that existed, that uh, which sort of resulted in the, you know, you know, uh, resistance in 19th, 20th century, early 20th century. I think if that is the way that we build a decolon decolonist historiography, I think we'll get into a lot of trouble with that kind of thing. That is what I I feel. I'm just yeah, mentioning it because that is because that is a kind of predicament that we are in today. Yeah, we that really agree. Kind of, that kind of predicament that we are in today. So one has to ask you, I agree with you fully that you have to develop resources from our side, which is based on our reality, our memories, as well as our experience. But that reality or memories and experience need not be a particular community's experience alone. Yeah. At least in countries like ours, the countries like India, for example. That is yeah. that is that should be the I think the uh, I mean I am just mentioning it just like that because yeah, you are the real the, real point. Yeah. This is this is what is you know all the sum of this. Yeah, that is the bit. And another thing, because we are not living there was no Kerala Mapula community. Yeah. <laughs> Even at the, that time, there was only Aranad Mapulas because the others, for example, the Taliparambu, Taliparambu people or the Kathalaseri people or Vadagara people did not join the rebellion. Yeah. That is also a reality which we have to accept it and, you know, and and explain as to why this has happened in this particular fashion. That's all. So yeah. Specific uh, contexts are very important. That's all I'm saying. Instead of going through Meta narratives of large scale, you know, wars. That's all. Yeah, great. You know, I think uh, you are what you said is in nutshell because the KCHR can take uh, an initiative, you know, to form our own things. And even you mentioned that uh, 57, 1857, that is the first in war of independence. I wrote in the book that you no, know, there is there are pre pre first war independence things, you know, in our yes, place. Definitely, there were. <laughs> So such kind of that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, it has to be reoriented in our own way. So I really agree with that. And thank you, thank you so much. much. Thank you so much for this kind of opportunity and hope we'll have more engagement in the future. <laughs>
Thank you very much. See you all. Mm, thank you, Professor Ganesh, for sharing the session. Thank you, Professor Dinesh, Dinesh uh, Madakinil, for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Abbas, for being part of our webinar. Uh, thank you for and thank you for the participants for actively taking part in the program. And finally, thank you for the entire KCHR team for supporting me during the coordination of the event. There is an announcement regarding our next webinar. It has been scheduled to be held on 6th September, Friday, by Dr. George Vergis K. on the topic, Dulius, Gyatari and Marx, exploring dialectics and differences as two philosophical procedures towards the arraignment of capitalism. All are invited. Thank you.